Amen. The question is often asked by non-Christians or those who no longer attend church, as well as those who still attend church, what's wrong with the church? Almost 2,000 years ago, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The early church described in Acts chapter 2 was known for its power, unity, correct biblical doctrine, prayer, strong male leadership, a commitment to fellowship of dedicated believers, and a simple message about the truth of Jesus Christ as they carried the gospel message throughout the Roman Empire. The disciples known as the ones who turned the world upside down. Few people would honestly dispute the fact that Christianity today bears little resemblance to the Christianity of the early church found in Acts chapter 2. In fact, Christentainment is a more accurate description of what we have seen in modern times. While traditional churches are on the decline, the churches that have adopted the easily listening version of salvation by self-help preaching is still on the rise. And it's the fastest growing movement, not just here in the United States, but around the world. Another black eye for the church is that Christian leaders are constantly in the news for some kind of moral failure. Scandal, controversy, and cover-up are the commonplace in the church today. The message uh, to the rest of the world is that Christ Christians are, are no different than anyone else, which is why many outside the church reject the church. At the same time, there is a mass exodus of people who are leaving the church, especially since the outbreak of COVID-19 in early 2020, as they have yet to return. Some are leaving because of, of hurt or anger, but many are leaving simply because they cannot play the religious game anymore. They once attended, supported, and gave money and feel as though they have gotten little or nothing in return. In their eyes, the social benefits of going to church could no longer compensate for the lack of a spiritual life. Also, church leaders are leaving too. Every week, a new group of pastors resign and quit the ministry because of burnout. So much Work to do, but not enough help to get it done. Another problem the church has is uncommitted members that are on the church roll, but still cannot be counted on. Although there is no such thing as a perfect church, there is such thing as committed members to the cause of Christ. I heard someone say it that, and I now realize that it's very true. The world is trying to find Jesus, but they can't. Because the church keeps getting in the way. I want to turn your attention to Matthew 16 as we begin a new series today. Amen. A little bit of background of Matthew 16. Early in the Gospel of Matthew, we learn that Jesus chose 12 men to be his disciples. Out of the other people at that time, including other disciples he had, Jesus spent more time training and preparing these 12 men to lead his ministry on earth that he started while he was still with them. During the, this time, many people had different opinions about Jesus' true identity. Even the 12 disciples had their doubts. However, out of all the people he encountered, Jesus wanted the 12 disciples to know his true identity because of the assignment he would give them once he returned to heaven. In our text today, Jesus led his disciples to a Gentile region called Caesarea Philippi. In ancient Israel, there were two cities named Caesarea. The first is Caesarea Maritime, which was located on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. And the second is Caesarea Philippi, which was an island city located approximately 25 miles north of the Sea of Galilee. This was the site of pagan worship for a nature god known as Pan and the home temple dedicated to Caesar Augustus, the Roman Empire. It was in the backdrop of this false religious territory that Jesus asked his disciples about his true identity. In lines, we start this series entitled and this message entitled The Church That Christ Built. Amen. In the Bible, when you see the word church, it is actually the Greek word ekklesia, 
It's actually two Greek words put together. Ek is a preposition, which means out of or out from. Klesio comes from kaleo, means to call. Together, it means called out ones or called out assembly. Amen? It's just it's reference to an assembly of a believers. And so when, you, when the Bible uses this word ecclesia, it's talking about the body of Christ. Amen? It's talking about redeemed people. It's talking about people who've accepted Jesus Christ as his saving Lord. However, when you find this word used in the Bible of references to the church, it's never talking about a building. It never refers to a building. Also, it never refers to a religion. And it never refers to a denomination. And it never refers to one individual. It's always referred to as a body of collected, collection, collected body of believers who have united themselves together under the direction of Jesus Christ, under the direction of the Holy Spirit, for the purpose of reaching the lost and discipling the saved. The church is the body of believers who, who are an alternate society in the world, as you might say, that come together because they worship and they serve Almighty God. And they love one another. Amen? So when we talk about church and we say, I'm going to church, oftentimes we just mean I'm going to a building. But what it should mean, even if you didn't have a building, it should mean you're going to worship. Amen? So stop telling people you're going to a building. You should tell them going to worship. Because you can do a whole lot of things in the building, but only you can worship God in his presence. Amen. Amen. Whether you're inside a building or outside a building. Amen. Are you with me? Amen. That doesn't mean that coming to corporate worship is not important and coming to the building that houses believers so that we can have a covering that we can worship God in and be in air condition, especially in 100 degree weather here in Texas at this time. Somebody ought to say Amen. I promise you, if the air conditioning wasn't working today, some of y'all, Pastor, you're going to have to speed that message up. I know you just started. Can you just give us the points so we can go? <laughs> Amen. So again, the church that who built? Christ built. Can you say that with me? The church that Christ built. Amen. So now we arrive at chapter, uh, I mean, verse 13 of chapter 16. And it reads as follows. It says, now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, whom do people say that the Son of Man is? Now you got to get it. Remember the backdrop. He's in a very pagan territory. Uh, the people there would not recognize him. And even people from his own Jewish territory didn't recognize him. And so he asked them a simple question. Who do people say the Son of Man is? Now, what's interesting, even though he was the Son of God, he would often refer to himself as the Son of Man. That's the most uh, used designation when Jesus talked about himself. And you might say, why did he call himself the Son of Man? Because he wanted to identify with us because he was the one that could redeem us. And he wanted to identify with his, with, with his creation, me and you, so that we would receive him and accept him as one of our own. The only thing about it, even though he was still God, he was still 100% man. 100% God and 100% man at the same time. Amen? So Jesus again withdrew from the mainly Jewish region of Galilee and came to a place more populated by Gentiles. This was likely a retreat from the pressing crowds. Caesarea Philippi is, again, a city 25 miles north of the Sea of Galilee and at the base of Mount Hermon, uh, and near the source of the Jordan River. And there was a temple honoring the Roman Empire Caesar, Augustus. Perhaps the uh, reverence for a mortal man is what prompted Jesus to ask his disciples, whom do people say I am? And they said, they said, all right, this is what the 12 said. Some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, but still others Jeremiah. Or one of the prophets. So apparently, there, there was a lot of speculation among the crowd about Jesus. Like Herod Antipas, in chapter 14 of Matthew, he actually believed Jesus was John the Baptist returned from the dead. Because remember, he is the one who put John the Baptist to death. And some thought Jesus, again, was John the Baptist, uh, 
Some thought it was Elijah or Jeremiah. Some thought Jesus was a reincarnation of one of the Old Testament prophets. To the average person, by comparing Jesus to these other men who were prophets in the Old Testament, it, he was looked at as one among many. Great, but not the greatest. But only seeing Jesus through human lenses, it was denying him of his deity. If Jesus was an own, only another man, then he'd have been a fraud because he claimed to be equal with God. Now, verse 15 says, and he said to them. Now, first he asked them, what do people say about me? Who, who, do, who, who do people say I am? Right. And then he said, well, who do you say I am? Who do you, my disciples, those who know me, those who've been following me, they watch me. They watch me do miracles up close and personal. They watch me walk on water. They watch me do all these amazing things that only God could have done. So who do you say that I am? So it was fine for disciples to know about others, what others thought, but Jesus wanted to know. Now, this is an omniscient. Jesus still had his omniscience. He knew already knew what they thought. He already knew what they believed. But see, he didn't ask the question for his benefit. He asked it for theirs. Amen. Because there's one thing he wanted them to know out of everybody else on the earth because he is training them to take over and, and run his earthly ministry as being his vessels, arms, eyes, ears, hands, and all of that when he goes back to heaven. So to all the people, he wanted to make sure that they knew. Amen. He wanted them to make sure that they knew. All right. So notice he says, whom do you? That's not directed to only Peter. That's, the, that's directed to all 12 of them because it's plural. Who do you say I am? So my question to you today, Agape, who do you say Jesus is? And does your lifestyle back up your testimony? Amen. Who do you say that Jesus is? Can anybody else find Jesus because they see your example? Can anybody walk with him and come to know him because of your speech and your attitude and your language, your behavior, your mannerisms? Can they know? Do they know? Amen? Now watch this. Now, out of all the 12, here is zealous Peter. Peter was often acting out ahead of the others. Every church needs a Peter, just like every church needs some Pauls. Amen? You need these type of people who are zealous for the Lord. Amen. You have too many Christians who believe that my Christianity is my own business. Well, you don't understand if you actually saved why God saved you. Because when he saved you, he didn't save you for your own business. Amen. Now, here's what Peter said. Now, you got to catch how he worded this. You got to catch how many definitive articles he uses. All right. When you attach the to anything, especially when it's unique, then you're saying that that is something that I'm pointing out that's different from others. Okay. Now, there are many churches, even along this street in this area. If you go farther enough on West Evan and go up the street and keep going, what turns into Sycamore School Road, there's many churches, if you keep going. However, there's only one Agape Community Fellowship of Fort Worth. So if you were to say that I attend Agape Community Fellowship of Fort Worth, it doesn't matter what other Agape churches are in Fort Worth, and there are many. But you say, I attend Agape Community Fellowship of Fort Worth, right? So that's definitive article. That means one and only. Are you, are you with me? All right. So Peter says, for you are. Now, that's singular. That's not plural because he, he's talking only about Jesus. He said, you are the Christ. The Greek word is Christos. The, the Hebrew equivalent is Messiah. It means anointed one. All right. He said, you are the Christ. Then he says, the son of the living God. He just exposed his whole title of who he and his being. By, by that statement alone. But watch this. 
When Peter, Peter knew that the opinion of the crowds that heard about Jesus wasn't accurate. Jesus was much more than John the Baptist or Elijah or one of the Old Testament prophets. Furthermore, he was more than a natural reformer, more than a miracle worker, more than a prophet, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, who came to seek and to save that which is lost. Note the Christ, meaning the Messiah, the Son, meaning God incarnate, and the living God, meaning the same God who introduced himself to the world in Genesis 1 and 1, when he said in the beginning was, was, uh, was God created the heavens and the earth. And then he reiterated that in John when he says in the beginning was the word and words with God and word was God. Amen. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you. Simon Barjona. This is what Peter, what Peter was referred to as, what Jesus often referred to Peter as Simon Barjona. He said, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. In other words, no human being revealed that to you. He even telling him, you didn't come up with that on your own. But he says that my father in heaven revealed this to you. My father in heaven gave the answer. He said, I, he, now here's the key. Verse 18 causes people trouble. And I'm going to explain why. Because after he says, for you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And he said, blessed are you. In other words, Peter, you are blessed because you know that. Peter, you are blessed because the Holy Spirit has given you divine wisdom. Amen. You are blessed. Then he goes a step further in, in verse 18. He says, I say also to you. All right. He said, you are Peter. And upon this rock, I will build my church. This causes a lot of problems in the Christian church. Depending on where you stand, depending on where you are. There has been a lot of controversy about this verse over the question, who is the rock? Part of the problem arises from the fact that the Greek words for Peter and rock are very similar. But the meanings are different. They're, 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 they're spelled similar. They look similar. They sound similar. But the meaning is different. You got to remember that. The first is Petros. It means stone or loose pebbles. Right? Second is Petra which means rock, such as a rocky ledge or a larger rock. Okay, so let me help you out. One Petros means stone. Petra means rock. All right? So when he says that, I say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. So what was Jesus really saying? He said, you are Peter, a stone, and upon this rock, I will build my church. No, Jesus did not say he would build his church on a stone, but upon a rock. You got to get this, because when you get it all wrong, then what happens is, then you elevate a man to a position God never intended for him to be. So if Peter is not the rock, who is? If we stick to the context of the conversation, if we stick to the context, when you're reading the Bible, always stick to the context. A lot of times we come up with bad doctrine is because we don't stick to the context. You can't read things into the scripture because that's called Isogeneous text. That's what theologians call isogeneous text. What you're supposed to do is what I'm doing to, with you right now is exegeting the text. In other words, instead of reading into it what's not there, you draw out of it what is there, which is, which is the word exegete. All right. Y'all still with me? So if Peter's not the rock. What's the answer? 
The answer is the rock is Peter's confession that Christ was the son of the living God. Y'all catch that? There's so many people get this wrong. Sometimes if you just learn a little bit of Hebrew and Greek, you, the Bible will come alive in so many ways that we don't understand. Right? So it's a reason why there exists a pope in the Catholic Church. All right? Now, those of us who are non-Catholic, what we call Protestant, well, we don't hold to that view. Amen. But it's built on this verse that you extract the position of the papacy. So, therefore, it lets us know the rock that it, that's being talked about in this text is Jesus. All right. He, then Jesus says, I will build. It demonstrates that Jesus is ultimately responsible for the establishment, growth, expansion, as well as the continuation of the church. Once again, the church is not a building. The church is the body of believers. And we may be under different umbrellas or under different roofs. But if we're truly Christian, regardless of race and ethnicity, we still serve one God. We might meet at different locations, but we're still part of the same assembly. Amen. Just try to make it plain. It doesn't matter if your umbrella is a Pentecostal umbrella or a Baptist umbrella and even a Catholic umbrella. If you are truly a Christian born again through the blood of Jesus Christ, you can put whatever designation behind that you want in front of that because God didn't create any of that anyway. We did. Amen. Oh, let me go a little bit step further. Let me help y'all out. I just want to help y'all out today. Here's the key. When you die and you meet Jesus. And you enter to get to the pearly gates of heaven. They're not going to give you a questionnaire. And on that questionnaire that says, were you a good Baptist? Were you a good Catholic? Were you a good Presbyterian or Episcopalian or any other thing? Uh, because, again, that won't matter to God. Right, man. Right. Amen. Amen. However, if you're truly a born-again believer and you follow in the scriptures, that doesn't mean that you cannot be a Christian if you, do not, if you attend a Methodist or Baptist or Pentecostal church. You can be. But here's what you got to know. You got to know what it is about your church, your assembly, that they believe that's biblical and what's tradition. All right? Because tradition can get in the way of true doctrine. But tradition should never, ever trump doctrine. Oh, y'all with me? Right, because you can have a tradition in your family. As a family, your tradition be every Friday night that hey, we go have pizza. What's wrong with that that position? It's all right as long as you invite Pastor Powell and says no. That's that, that's a good tradition. That's a good tradition. <laughs> Amen. But see, sometimes traditions can get in the way of what's really important because sometimes traditions have a shelf life. Let me help you out again. You know that person that sings in the choir, you know they can't sing, but they've been singing for years, and they've been wanting every year during the annual church anniversary, and they want, they want to sing a song, even though it's been dated, and they shouldn't be singing no more because we passed that, and they really don't sound good anyway, but because they've been on the program for so long, and nobody wants to offend them, so they put, keep putting them back on the program, even though people close their ears when they get up and sing, or they tip out and go to the restroom, that's a bad tradition. It's okay that you used to do that, but sometimes it's okay to develop new traditions. As long as they're Bible-based is what I'm getting at. Amen? Now, by the way, this is the first time the word church is used in the Bible. Jesus uses it. The very first time it's used. Amen? Then he says something else behind that. When he says, upon this rock I should build my church, then the other part of this scripture causes even more problems to people. Because guess what he says? And the gates of hell were not overpowered. Jesus offers 
also offered a promise that the forces of death and darkness can't prevail against the conquer or conquer the church. This is a valuable promise in the dark, in dark or discouraging times for the church. Satan works overtime to clear out the church. Does he not? But my Bible tells me that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. In other words, all the power and policy of hell combined cannot, that's what the gates of hell is a symbolism of, cannot overcome the church. Because if everybody else gives up, and even churches shrink in numbers, there's going to be somebody that shows up and say, we still committed. Amen. Pastor, you can still count on us. Amen. Those other folks might have left, but pastor, we still part of this church, and you can count on us. Amen. As long as God keeps the lights on and keeps us in here, we're going to be here. Amen. That's what every believer should say. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. You ought to know where you're being fed. Yeah. Amen. I don't think you go to restaurants that's got bad food. Over and over again. You don't do that, do you? The moment that you go to a restaurant with bad service or bad food, you probably don't go back again. Now you might say, that might have been a bad day, so let me go back and try that again. Because I heard some good things about this place. And you go back again, and you say, no, this ain't for me. And it's at that point you figure out, I'm not going there again. All right? However, when you're going to a place where you're getting spiritual food, right. why don't you want to go there again and again? Why don't you want a good spiritual meal? Oh, that's because you like being entertained. That's because you like someone telling you and puffing you up and, and giving you fluff and making you feel good about yourself, even though you know you're not living according to God's plan and purpose. But the moment somebody come on your street, knock on your step in your living room with the word of God, guess what? Oh, boy. I don't know if I want to go back there. They, they, they in my business. They, 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 they in my business. I don't know if I want, to, I want to go back there. And the reason why I don't want to go back there because I don't plan on changing. Because ain't nothing wrong with me. It's something wrong with them. Amen? Then he says, I will give you. This is plural again. The keys to the kingdom of heaven. He's not just talking about Peter, he's talking about the disciples. Then he says, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth, earth shall be loosed in heaven. Keys are symbols of authority, as well as access or entrance. Jewish rabbis use the word binds and loose to, to denote decisions about what was or what was not permitted. Note the disciples could permit or prohibit only what had already been permitted or prohibited in heaven. In other words, it was not something they made up on their own and say, we're going to permit this or we're going to deny this. What they had to do is look to heaven and see what heaven was permitting that be permitted in the church and what the heaven was pro, uh, not only permitting but prohibiting. What does God not want in this church? Then that's not what we want in church down here. Making it plain. Amen. And then what's interesting, he warned the disciples that they should not tell anyone that he was the Christ. Why did he do that? Because they were not ready to tell the story. He's not done training them. He's not through with them yet. Because he knew if they went out right now and start trying to tell people, like he wanted them to tell them, they'd be going out on their own. Because he had to fully prepare them. You wouldn't want anybody operating on you who didn't finish medical school, would you? Well. Now, you might. I don't. I, I wouldn't. You wouldn't want to go to the dentist's office and he say, oh, by the way, I printed that diploma out yesterday. I really didn't go to dental school, but I did sleep in a Holiday Inn. You, you, wouldn't, want, you, you wouldn't want to expose yourself to that, would you? Well, why do you expose yourself to the churches and places and park yourself there where you know that people don't know the Bible? But you go because of friendships. You go for, because of social atmosphere. You go because of the entertaining factor. Maybe they got a good choir, whatever it may be, and you know. And, but the sad thing is that there are people who don't know that they pastor don't know the Bible because they don't know it either. 
Amen. So when he tells them to turn, hey, to the 10th chapter, uh, the book of Hezekiah, they turn it. They don't know it's not in there. They're not familiar with the Bible. Now, here's the thing. The church that Christ built. All right? So, what does Matthew teach us about the church that Christ promised to build? I waited to the end to give you the points, by the way. Number one, the church will be built on Christ. Number two, the disciples will be instrumental in the establishment of the church. We know that from what Paul tells us in Ephesians 2.20 when he says the church was established on the apostles and prophets. Amen? In other words, they were instrumental. The, uh, the apostles and prophets were instrumental in God using them to establish the church. Amen? It's not built on the apostles, the prophets, Peter, anybody. It's built on Christ. But don't you think God, he uses human vessels like me and you, invites us to be involved in what he's up to? Yeah. Amen. Let me ask you a question. Have you accepted your assignment? <laughs> Have you accepted your assignment? Because uh, when you call to salvation, it's a call within a call. Because you're called not only to salvation, but you're called to serve. Amen. And if you're only concerned about being salvation, about salvation because you want to get out of hell free card, then you're looking at it from the wrong perspective. Amen? Now, the third point, let me give you the first point. If you're taking notes, the church will be built on Christ. The second point is the disciples will be instrumental in the establishment of the church. And the third point that we get from Matthew's text is the devil would not be able to destroy the church. All right? Now, the three phases of the Pentecost that resulted in the birth and expansion of the Christian church. Now, remember... We went through about the difference between Petros and Petra. We went through the difference between the rock and stone. All right. However, Jesus was telling Peter that he would be instrumental. Now, let me show you how Peter was instrumental. As being a stone. Not the cornerstone, because that's Jesus. Acts chapter 2. You have the movement of the, of the church. The Holy Spirit is moving and establishing the church of Jesus Christ, working through men and women just like me and you, ordinary people. Acts chapter 2 is when the Jews were brought into the church. In Acts chapter 8, the Samaritans, the half-Jews, half-Gentiles, were brought into the church. In Acts chapter 10, the Gentiles were brought into the church. Amen? So with the time I have remaining, I'm going to explain this a little bit to you, and then we're going to be done. First of all, the Jews. Now, what's going on, we, by the time we get to verse 37, uh, you have the uh, Pentecost, as, uh, the Holy Spirit is broken out. And just like Joe said, has fallen on people. Here you have the Jews were in Jerusalem. They stayed another 50 days because they came for the Passover, but they stayed for Pentecost. But on Pentecost, God basically revolutionizes Pentecost and it becomes something different than it wasn't before because he chose to birth the church on that at that time. And all of those people present from Corinthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia and Cappadocia, both uh, Jews and proselytes, it would say. A proselyte was a Gentile who became a Jew by the process of baptism and circumcision. Right. So all these people are present. The church starts multi-racial, multi-ethnic, by the way. Only difference was they, the, their beliefs were Judaism. That's the difference. Race and ethnicity. And the only de designation that you were called in those days, they didn't use terms like Caucasian or black or African-American or Hispanic. They didn't use any of that. Even though there are people who existed, they didn't use that. You either called the Jew a Samaritan or a Gentile. All right? Y'all with me? And because there was so much division between these three groups of people that God wanted to unite them together under the umbrella of Jesus Christ and put them in his church. Are you with me? All right? So Acts chapter 2 was the Jews. So it said, now and then when they heard this, this is Peter's sermon uh, that they're hearing, he said they were pierced through the heart. That means they were convicted of their sin. 
And he said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what must we do? That's what happens when you hear a message from God. There's a decision you have to make. Even if you already accepted Christ, you have to make a decision once you heard that message. Amen. If you're already a believer and you have a message, then what it should do is encourage you to walk with God even closer. Amen. And whatever you're missing or leaving out, then it should challenge you to repent of that if, you, if, if it's willful disobedience, especially, and then turn to God and say, God, help me do that better. All right? There's always a decision. God don't bring you to church and, and have you hear a sermon, and there's not a decision that you have to make behind it. Now, if you already accepted Christ, then there's something else that God is trying to take you beyond that confession of faith. Amen? He, Peter tells them, repent, and each of you be baptized. The word repent is the Greek word matineo. It means to change your perception or change your understanding. All right? Proverbs 23, 7 says, a man thinks, so is he. Therefore, if I never change the way I think, I never change the way I live. All right? So repent, each of you, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. The word baptism, the Greek word baptizo. Baptizo is one of those words that's transliterated, uh, Meaning it keeps keeps from one language to another the same literary form. And the reason why you know that, because baptizo sounds just like baptism. Now, most words are not transliterated. Most uh, words in the Bible are translated. That means they take on a whole new word form and uh, take other discernment and study to figure them out. All right? So he said, baptize in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises for you and your children, for all who are far off, as many as the Lord has called to himself. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on encouraging them, saying, be saved from this per perverse generation. So then those who received this word were baptized. And that day there were added 3000 souls to the Christian church. Now, here's how you know that they were serious. And also why some of us can figure out why well, we're not serious. It's because they did four things. Four things on the regular. Four things they did continually, day by day. They did four things. Number one, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Number two, they devoted themselves to fellowship. That word is koinonia. It means intimacy and participation. Number three, they, brought, they committed themselves to breaking the bread. That, that, that had two meanings to it. One, breaking the bread was a symbol of worship, so they worshiped. Also, breaking the bread was a symbol that they met together and had, and had meals together. And the fourth thing they did was they had prayer continually. And because of that, read the rest of this chapter, that God added to the church and church began to make a difference. And people's lives were turned uh, from darkness to light. Now, Acts chapter 8, the Samaritans, all right? So the church is growing, the church is moving. And so here's Philip. Philip goes along, and he's been led by the Holy Spirit, full of the Holy Spirit. He's preaching. That same Philip who was a deacon, now he becomes a missionary, evangelist, if you will. It said, now a man named Simon had previously preached magic in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming to be someone great. And all the people from small to great were praying, uh, paying attention to him, saying, this man is the uh, power of God that is called great. Now, we know what happens in our society today when something is happening, guess what we do? Because we love to see a train wreck, don't we? Because what do we do when, when there's an accident up ahead? We ain't going to render no aid, but we're going to see what's going on. And you would think that the, the accident is on your side of the highway because everybody's rubbernecking and slowing down and breaking, but when you get up further, you find out it's on the other side of the highway. And all these people to slow down just so they can See what's going on. I wonder, I wonder what's going on. There's somebody running, running to their rear end. They're like, why you hit me? Because I'm going 60 miles an hour and you decide to do no miles an hour on the same road. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. And so they were paying attention to him, to Simon, because for a long time he had astounded them with his magic acts. In other words, his demonic activity. But, they, but when they believed Philip, because Philip is preaching the gospel, as he was preaching the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. There's a word again. Now, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard, drop down to verse 14 from 12, 
Now, when the apostles heard the Samaritans had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John. But why did they send Peter and John? Who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. This is interesting. Because they, it said they believed and they were saved. And they were even baptized. But here it says that they sent them so they can receive the Holy Spirit. What is God doing? As long as the apostles were alive and long as the church was spreading, God didn't want a different church that's over in Jerusalem, in Antioch, or anywhere else. All right? In other words, different people, different structures, same doctrine. Are you getting this? And therefore, to show that this is a move of God, God sent these men that were anointed as apostles and pillars of the founding of the church. He sent them there. And it wasn't until they, he sent them there that when they laid hands on them, now they received the power of the Holy Spirit. Oh, now y'all get it. All right? Now they already say, but now they need the power of the Holy Spirit to impact that community for the glory of God. Third point and final point, Acts chapter 10 is the Gentiles. So in the Gentiles, it begins with Peter being, Peter's waiting on uh, them to cook some food. So he goes up on the roof that, you know, he falls into a trance and, and he sees a vision. And in that vision, it, God shows him a sheet that's held by four corners. And in that sheet, it had animals that a self-respecting Jew would not dare to eat. And so the vision, in the vision, God tells Peter, kill and eat. Peter say, no, Lord. I never did anything unclean. And then God says, how are you going to call something unclean I call clean? All right. That, that vision did two things. All right. It, it ridded them of following those dietary laws and things they used to follow in the Old Testament. That was number one. Number two, it showed that salvation was for everybody. All right. Salvation for everybody. Now, Peter doesn't, he's, he's perplexed because he doesn't know what this means. Then he gets a knock on the door and God sends men there to get Peter because Peter, those men were sent from Cornelius. Cornelius, they go there to find Peter and then the Holy Spirit tells Peter, hey, they down there knocking on the door. Go down there and go with them. Now, Peter said, wait a minute, I'm waiting on my, my burger to be finished, my fries. I'm, I'm kind of hungry. You know, okay, can I, you know. They got up and they, they left the next day. They travel, they, they travel back. So they get to Cornelius now. Peter doesn't understand what this vision means. Until he, he obeyed God, this is why you got to obey God. Because if you don't obey him, he can give you divine instruction, but you won't be able to walk in the power of it until you follow and do what he told you to do. So he gets to, he gets to Cornelius' door, and the, po and the Holy Spirit drops some knowledge on him. It's so a divine wisdom of what that vision was really like. Because remember, Cornelius is called a God fear. That's about as close to the God, being a child of God in the Old Testament, you, I mean the New Testament you can be, old, old or new, a God, because they only use the New Testament, a God fear. In other words, because he did acts of kindness for the church, but he wasn't saved. All right? So you can be a God fear and still not be saved, because Cornelius wasn't. But, it, but Cornelius had gotten God's attention. And God wanted Cornelius and his family saved. And so he sends Peter. So when Peter walks in Cornelius' house, and Cornelius got all his family there and everybody. And it was then that, that Peter understood that salvation is for the Gentiles too. Salvation is for the Gentiles too. So verse 30 says, Cornelius said, and Cornelius began to tell his story about four days ago. To this hour, I was praying in my house during the ninth hour, which is 3 p.m., and behold, a man stood before me shining in clothing, which is an angel. And he said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard, and your charitable gifts have been remembered before, the God, before God. Verse 32, therefore send some men to Joppa and invite Simon, who is called Peter, to come to you. He is staying at the house of Simon the Tanner by the sea. So I sent men to you immediately, and you have been kind enough to come. Now then, we are all present before God to hear everything that you have been commanded to the Lord. Boy, only the church would follow that. Only the church had enough desire to say, man, 
I know that my pastor is anointed, and I know he preached the word of God, and every time I can show up and hear and be taught by the leaders of our church who are teaching the Bible correctly, I'm going. Because I ain't missing no spiritual meals. I'm going. Amen? You might as well go, because if you don't come, then guess what? God holds you accountable for what you miss. All right? Just want to make it plain to you. And so while, while Peter was speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon those who were listening to the message. And all the Jewish believers who came with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had also been poured out to the Gentiles. Wow. Wow. The Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles. What's the name of this? The title of this sermon? The Church of Christ Built. The church that Christ built. Not man built. The church that Christ built. Amen. Because when it's a church that Christ built, then lives are going to be transformed. Amen. People's lives are going to be changed for the glory of God. Amen. I hope that you stay, stay tuned. Because remember I told you we're going to go into Revelation. Before we can get there, we got to take this route. Because we're going to continue with the seven churches that Paul had a lot to do with. Amen. Continue the message of the church that Christ built. So next Sunday, we're going to deal with the church of Rome. All right. All right. All right. The church that Christ built. Amen. And if you're part of that church, God's church, because the Bible tells us God is coming back for his church. He ain't coming back for this building or no other building. He's coming back for his people without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. That means that heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. So what I leave you with, is that a question? Or are you allowing God to prepare you? Because your availability is God's opportunity for him to prepare you for heaven. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a hand of praise. <laughs> Let us pray together, shall we? Eternal God, our Father, we bow before you now. We thank you, O God, for your word today. We thank you, O God, for what you taught us through your word. Speaking to our hearts, O God. Lord, perhaps there's someone listening today. Maybe they've been stirred. Maybe they realize that I have not been a good member of the body of Christ. And Lord, I want to recommit my life to you. I want to ask for forgiveness while falling short and missed the mark. Or perhaps you're listening and today is the day of salvation for you. Maybe God made it clear to you of what it means to be saved through faith in Jesus Christ and him alone. So I invite you to pray this prayer with me. Just say, Lord Jesus, here I am. I admit that I'm a sinner and I want to be saved. Lord, help me get out of my own way. I turn my heart and my life to you. Even if I prayed this before, I'm praying it again now, oh God. I ask you to forgive me all my sins, past, present, and future. Keep me on the straight and narrow. Help me to walk with you, to talk with you, to live for you, and to do your will through and through. Father, I pray you fill me with the, your Holy Spirit afresh and anew. That will empower me to live according to your will, I pray. And I thank you for saving me. Now I ask, oh God, that you teach me, guide me, lead me, and use me for your glory. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. And all of God's people said amen. amen. Give the Lord a hand of praise.
you to go to our website at agapecommunityfellowship.org and you can listen to this message and message from the past in their entirety. And also we're going to encourage you if you go to our website there's an opportunity for you to give. Most of us give uh, digitally or electronically these days. Uh, so we thank you, thankful for that, for your giving because your giving helps us do the ministries and things that we do here at Agape. And so again, we say thank you for your giving, your contribution, and for your presence today. We continue to ask you to pray for those on our prayer list. Also, uh, hopefully see you on Wednesday night. We'll do a deeper dive into our text. Uh, to, uh, the, the Bible study lesson has already been sent out. 
and we hope to see you on Wednesday. Also, we want you to put in your calendar. Uh, some of you have not been coming to our prayer breakfast. Uh, we've been having a really, really good time with those studies and the time of prayer. 9.30, uh, we invite you to come. If you'd like to bring a breakfast dish with you to help contribute to the meal because it's more of a potluck kind of thing, uh, please feel free to do so. But more importantly, uh, we want you to come in your presence. Amen. We thank God once again for each of you. I hope that you continue to pray for all of our members, those who are traveling. All, everyone on our prayer list, we want to pray for them. We thank God for them. We thank God for our missionary day. Brother Ronnie Davis, we thank God for you, my neighbor. God bless you. His wife, uh, Sister Gail, she's not with him today. Hopefully he'll come back and bring her Amen. with him so we get to meet this wonderful woman who's tied to this man. <laughs> Amen. Also, we want to acknowledge uh, our dear sister, uh, sister Sheila Foster. She's worship. I mean, Fisher, she's worshiped with us before, but we want to acknowledge you and thank you for coming and sharing with us as well as all the rest of you. Amen. Let us stand for our benediction. Remember your announcements. May you have a blessed week as our prayer. We're still praying for Reverend Russell and all those who are not with us, the Sobers family who will be returning this month. Um, and so we want to pray for them as well. We want to continue to pray uh, for the Air Muse who are uh, out today as well. We want to pray for, uh, continue to pray for Brother Dapo with the problems he's having uh, with infection. A couple of years back, I'm told that he fell, and he fell on his face on that side. 